Hey everybody, MS Farzan here, and welcome back to this video series on how to make a 2D multiplayer tabletop card game using Unity and Mirror. I've received a few requests and feedback about how to implement game logic using the system that we've been using for this video series. And uh, I thought I would try my hand at providing one solution uh, about how to go about doing this. Uh, and so if you're watching this video series, you might notice that this video is kind of out of order. Um, I'm recording this uh, uh, specific tutorial video after the entire series is complete. So this really should come after the de deployment uh, video, which comes next uh, in terms of uh, chronology. But it just makes more sense to, to talk about game logic uh, before talking about deployment. Uh, so, and I, I must say thanks very much to the, the helpful people on the Mirror Discord, which uh, who uh, have helped me to kind of puzzle, puzzle through how to go about this in our specific uh, game development environment. So the idea is that you have this this um, kind of prototype or template uh, up and running. How do you implement your own game logic? And the I'll show you one way that I have uh, kind of muddled through how to how to. Uh, implement this. And it's a fairly simple um, uh, way to go about this, so I think it will feel uh, pretty natural to you about how to go about this. So the first thing I'm going to do in my hier hierarchy here, I'm just going to create an empty game object, and I'm just going to call it Game Manager. And I'll add a uh, network component. Uh, network identity, I should say. And I'm going to click this little button here in the inspector that says server only because I want the server, at least in this prototype or template, I want the server to manage uh, this uh, object for me and only have access to it. None of the clients need to know what's going on unless the server tells them to. So I click that and I'm also going to add a component here and I'm going to add a new script. And we're also going to call this game manager. Game manager.cs is what's going to be created for us. Um, I'll go into my assets directory and just um, move this script over to my scripts directory. Okay. And uh, I think it has helpfully opened this for me, even though I didn't ask it to in Visual Studio, but okay. What can you do? And. Um, so essentially what we're going to do here is we're uh, going to handle our game logic, uh, very basic game logic in this game manager script, um, which hasn't opened yet. Uh, and so um, uh, before we kind of dig into this, I'm just going to set the scene so that it makes sense for, um, for uh, in the editor for everything that I need. And so what I need to do here is um, that's all the work I need to do for my game manager game object. So I'm going to just drag that. Well, let me just go into my prefabs folder. And I'm going to drag that to my prefabs folder. Uh, and <clears throat> then I'm going to find my network manager here. And I'm going to drag the, um, the game manager. Well, uh, first I will create a uh, spawnable prefab field, just as I have for my cards, my drop zone, enemy area, so on and so forth. I'm going to drag my game manager object, well, the prefab for it here, so that now the uh, network manager can spawn it at runtime. That's basically all I need to do in terms of the editor, and we have that all set up. Now let's look. Let's go into the code for this. In my uh, my code editor in Visual Studio, where did that script go? Uh, I'm going to open it and. Uh, just as I've done before, I'm going to add a using mirror statement. And I'm going to make sure that it derives from um, network behavior. And then I'm just going to add a, uh, you know, some simple things to help us keep track of what's going on in the game. And this could be the the starting point or the entry point for a lot of different things that you you uh, might want to handle. So let's just add a public integer turns played and have that equal zero at the start of the game and let's have a public void update turns played that then increments the turns played variable 
So we're going to track how many turns have been played. Now I'll go into my player manager and I'm going to find the, um, for this uh, demonstration at least, I'm going to find the public void uh, play card method. Um, this is the one that, um, that when you might recall that when in our um, drag drop script, that's the uh, methods that, that is called when somebody drops a card. Basically, they've taken their turn and they pass in the game object. Back to my player manager. Um, I find that play card method, and what it does is it runs the command play card uh, um, command. Cool. So finding that command play card, uh, right here I have, what, it, what does it do? It runs the remote procedure call show card. And uh, right under that, I'm going to write if is server, and then we're going to do something else. We're going to say update turns played. That's going to be a new um, method that we're going to call. So we're we're just when someone plays a card, uh, the, there's a command that is run on the server by uh, requested by a client, and then that in in turn that command um, waterfalls to a remote procedure call so that all uh, clients can show that card. And we're also within that command we're saying if this is the server, which it should be because it's the um, only servers can run the command, uh, we will uh, run another method, update turns played. So let's write that here. So we'll put the server attribute, which is what you want to do if you um, if a method is only to be run by the server, and we'll say void update. It's a private uh, method. Update turns played, and what this method is going to do. The, the first thing, oh, that didn't spell that right. The first thing it's going to do, it's going to locate a game manager. Uh, we'll just call it GM. And uh, we'll say game object find in the scene, game object dot find, find the game manager, which is what we've called this in our uh, in in Unity, this uh, this object that will be spawned. Find game manager. And then we'll say get component, and we want the game manager script that's attached to it. And um, I wrote that wrong, game object. So we're um, instantiating a, uh, or we're um, creating a GM variable, which is uh, of type game manager, and we want uh, to find that object in the in, that's alive at runtime, and we want to get the game manager script attached to it. And when this update turns played method is run, we want to also run the GM update turns played method, which should incre increment the turns played variable. And then at the end of this, so that's we're just hoping that's going to happen, but the way we're going to demonstrate that this has happened is we're going to write a new remote procedure call. And this is uh, RPC, we'll call it RPC log to clients, and we'll say turns played plus gm dot turns played. We haven't written that remote procedure call, so let's do that. Remember, you need a client RPC uh, attribute here, and we'll call this void RPC log to clients, and it will take a string message. And what we want to do is just debug log whatever that message is. This could also be helpful if you just need a way to uh, log to all your clients' um, uh, messages. Okay, so the the in the drag drop script, uh, a card is dropped into a drop into you know wherever the drop zone, and then um, it we show the cards among all the clients. But now we're also asking the server to run this update update turns played method, uh, which can only be run by the server, and the uh, the game manager uh, is found. We find the game manager 
we get the script attached to it. We run the um, update turns played method, which increments the, the turns played variable. And then we run another remote procedure call to log to all the clients um, what uh, how many turns have been played. And so then we know that this is something that actually lives on the server. It doesn't live on one particular client, and all clients should receive the same message that the um, that how about how many turns have been played. And that's what this remote procedure call is used. You could also use this remote procedure call for anything if you just need to to log a message to all clients to make sure that something is working correctly. Okay, that's all saved, and now let's let's run the game. Um, so I have two clients uh, or two uh, editors open right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build, uh, well, I'm going to save everything, and then I'm going to build a, a third uh, version of the game so we can just try different permutations of this and make sure that they all work. And um, you can find all this code on the, I've updated the repository, the GitHub for this that's located in the description for this video. Um, and also something fun is that I've created a, a Unity package for this project that's also linked in the description of this video. And it lives on the GitHub repository anyway, so if you just wanted to download that, you could as well. Okay, so um, let's start this uh, running this as a host. And then the uh, game editor the Unity editor will run that as a client. And um, you know what? I'm going to stop this and I want to run it. Let's run it at um, non maximized on play just so we can see the console a bit easier here. Okay, so the built run ver version is running as a host, and the client is here in the editor. And I'm going to draw cards on the client. I'm going to draw cards on the on the um, host. I'm going to let's say I'm just going to click on one of these cards, and I see it's been clicked one time. Just making sure that everything still works the same way that it did before. Yep, that my um, uh, um, uh, sync fair is working properly. And then now I'm going to start playing turns, and I'm going to draw a card from this um, uh, from the the client and drop it and it says turns played one. Now here's the important point. Now from the uh, host side, I'm also going to draw a card and drop it in the drop zone. And let's see, it says turn played two in the host and it also says it here in the uh, in the, the client version of the game. I do it again and again and that all just works just fine. I have the four turns have been played. Just gonna um, stop the client here and stop the host. And now instead, I'm gonna run the built version as server only. And my um, uh, first editor, I'm gonna run as a client. And now I have a second editor, a clone here, running. I'm gonna also run this as a client. So just, just to show that it works both with the host client version, um, uh, yes, I want to reload this. It works both with the host client version, uh, but we also want to demonstrate that it works with a server uh, and two uh, separate clients. So let's do that here. I run, I play the game. It's maximized on play, so I'm going to have to work around that again. Okay, don't maximize that on play. Show me the console. Hit play again. Now this is going to run as a client, and so I draw cards on this client, and the cards appear here. I draw cards on the other client. We'll test our other things. Look, I'm. Um, uh, uh, oh, let me clear my um, my logs here. I click on this. This has been clicked two times because I just clicked on it, um, and, and I get the same message here. And now it's been clicked three times, so things are working as they should be. I'm just I don't I don't know why I'm fretting about this. So everything's working fine. Now um, on this uh, on the um, the cloned uh, editor, I drag and drop, and uh, it says turns played five. That's because the the host hasn't technically been uh, stopped here. At least I think that's what's going on. So let's actually do this, um, and it's still working. So that's fine. We see that I pl played seven times, and now I've played eight times. 
So that's all well and good. What I think has happened here is that because we we have, um, um, uh, although we have, uh, I think we stopped the host originally, some of that state data is pres preserved, I've seen. So what I'm just gonna do here is I'm gonna close this, um, close this up to just like make sure the whole session is, um, is uh, wiped and we can just start over fresh, uh, build, rebuild everything. And probably the best way to do this rather than building um, every time is just to have two different clones of your original editor and then you, 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 know, you can manage that way. But in any case, okay. So the built version is gonna uh, operate as a server and we'll try this again. The uh, original editor is gonna be a client, let's say client A, and then the other version, the clone version is gonna be client B. Okay, and now on client A, I draw cards. On client B, I draw cards. And then here's the moment of truth. I'm gonna drag, well, let's start with client A. I'm gonna drag and drop and turns played are one. And then I'm gonna drag and drop on client B and there's two turns played. So that that uh, data is persistent. It's something that's happening on the server and the server is then running a remote procedure call to each of the clients, letting them know that um, the number of turns that have been played, which uh, is actually pretty cool. I think it's a the it's the easiest way I've found to to uh, make this work. Um, you might be saying, well, okay, how does that demonstrate game logic? And I think the important thing to consider is this is this could be the main entry point for your game logic in your game. You could say that um, let's say you're keeping track of. Um, I want to think of something different than like player health, which you could use just like a sync variable on each client. Um, well, how many turns have been played? That might be a thing like your game says after there's five turns, like something should happen or you have to stay, store some kind of state that is client agnostic, that it, it exists outside of each client and the, the clients might permute that state in some way, but you need the server and only the server to keep control of that game logic and then, um, and then disperse that information as necessary. Um, it could be like the number of rounds that a certain spell effect uh, um, is required to, uh, uh, the, the number of rounds of play that a certain spell effect um, exists for, um, or it could be, oh, I don't know, um, something like if you're making a Magic the Gathering clone, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, maybe it's the the, the um, amount of magic that gets distributed to each player each turn or something, you know, something like that. I don't know. Uh, amount of mana that gets uh, um, distributed to each player each turn. Uh, so something that is central to your game logic, but um, you don't necessarily want, like you want one source of truth for it and you don't necessarily want your uh, each of your clients to handle it or to duplicate it using sync variables the way you would with like player health or um, or uh, um, each player's cards or something like that um, that that you could handle with a sync variable. Anyway, I hope this help this is helpful for you. This is uh, you know as I mentioned, I received some feedback requesting uh, um, uh, some information about game logic. The older version of this series had one way of doing it, which after working with uh, Unity and Mirror for more time. And, and recreating this series, this update, I feel like the way I was doing it is a bit antiquated and a little backwards. So, um, you know, if you've already followed that series, uh, thanks for following through. But at the same time, this is probably a more uh, elegant way of doing it. And uh, I'd love to hear your feedback about how you've implemented it and how it's worked for you. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the original video series and talk about deployment in the next video. For now, I hope this vi this video has been informational uh, and helpful for you. If it has, please be, sh be sure to like it and subscribe to my channel for more. You can also follow me on Twitter, and I'd love for you to check out my games at nightpathpub.com, and we'll see you soon.